Yo, yo, I'm Yovan Buha, Lakers beat writer for The Athletic, and welcome to another Lakers postgame reaction show. I just got back from Crypto.com Arena, where the Lakers lost to the Golden State Warriors 128 to 121. And this was a wild game. This was a bizarre game, a crazy ending, uh, a crazy beginning for the Lakers, given what happened at the end of the first quarter. A lot to touch on here, but before I get into my three takeaways, I want to quickly summarize the game. So the Lakers got off to a good start. They're up by a few points for most of the first quarter. Uh, defense was not great, but they were outscoring the Warriors, which has been the way that the Lakers have been winning games lately. And Anthony Davis had eight points for rebounds, had a solid quarter. LA was plus seven in the 12 minutes that he played uh, in that first quarter. But at the 247 mark, uh, he catches a pass from D'Angelo Russell finishes in transition and gets hit in the face by Warriors rookie uh, big man Trace Jackson Davis and AD falls he's holding his face and that tends to happen every few games with AD where he'll take a shot or, or something happens where it looks like he's about to be injured or something serious happen and this season unlike in previous seasons he's been fine for the most part uh, but this was the one time where uh, there, there was a screenshot on the broadcast of his eye, and it looked like he got punched in the eye. It was very swollen, uh, basically swollen shut. And he plays the final 247 of that quarter, but during the break in between the first and the second, he goes back to the locker room. And typically when a player goes back to the locker room, uh, they're there for five to 10 minutes and they come back. There's been several times this season, AD has gone back to the locker room. There's been times LeBron James has gone back to the locker room and typically it's it's nothing serious that they're just checking something out testing things or uh you know just evaluating so ad goes back and we're waiting for an update from the team we're waiting for uh you know some clarification as to is he returning is he not returning like what's the injury what, what's the severity of it and during the second quarter uh it, it's it's crickets so we can start to tell that this is serious once rich paul goes back to the locker room. He sits right in front of us, uh, right in front of the, the beat writer row. Uh, it, we sit kind of like second row. He sits front row, uh, baseline. So he goes back to the locker room. Then I see Rob Palinka go back to the locker room. And that's when you can kind of tell something's going on. Uh, another detail I picked up on was Maxwell Lewis, uh, LA's rookie, was sitting in the second row next to Harry Giles because they, they don't have enough seats on the, the Lakers bench. Uh, so sometimes, uh, you know, the, the guys lower on the totem pole have to sit uh, be behind the, the front row of the bench. It's been a few minutes and a couple of the Lakers training staff people who had gone back with AD come out and, and they start talking to players and people on the bench. That's the, that's like the warning sign there of he's probably not coming back. But then I see Maxwell Lewis go from the second row to the front row. And that's when I had a feeling like if he's sitting there, uh, it could be temporary just until AD's back and like guys do switch spots on the bench all the time uh, of course lebron and ad have their typical spots but like guys will move around on the bench i don't want to say that's uncommon but once maxwell lewis sat there i just had a feeling that ad was likely done for the night uh, so apparently according to darvin ham the lakers were working on uh, anthony like the the lakers medical team was working on anthony davis all throughout the second quarter and into halftime, you know, hoping that he could return for the second half. Uh, but he was ruled out uh, shortly into the third quarter. Uh, Jackson Hayes started in place of him uh, in the second half. And the Lakers missed the, the guy who's been Mr. Reliable for them this season, you know, basically played in every game, has been the, the key to their defense. It hasn't been great lately, but without AD, as we saw in the second half of this game, it was much worse. And... It was just a, a fatal blow for the Lakers. Uh, again, uh, they lose this game by seven points. They were plus seven in the 12 minutes that Anthony Davis played and minus 14 in the uh, following 36 minutes. So, uh, you know, Golden State, though it was close at halftime, Golden State was only up by one. Uh, it was felt inevitable that Golden State would pull away at some point in the second half. They did that in the third quarter. A, a brutal loss for the Lakers. I haven't gotten to the craziest part of all, which was that the final minute 50 of gameplay took a real life 22 minutes uh, due to challenges, due to uh, shot clock malfunctions, and uh, just a billion replays. Uh, fans were booing, fans were upset. 
Uh, there was awkward shots of celebrities in the crowd uh, on the TV telecast. And we'll, we'll get into all that. But let's start with takeaway number one, which is Anthony Davis's eye injury is potentially concerning. And there's been different versions of what has been out there. Uh, so the Lakers are calling it an eye contusion, uh, which is essentially an eye bruise. And that would explain the swelling around his eye, why his eye uh, was swollen shut. Basham Sharania, my colleague at The Athletic, reported that Davis has a corneal abrasion, and that is a different injury. That is a scratch on the cornea. Uh, so two different things there. If AD does have a corneal abrasion, I mean, and they're not mutually exclusive, so he could have both. Uh, but if he does have a corneal abrasion, that is a more serious injury that could potentially keep him out for another game. Uh, Lakers do have a, an odd schedule next week where they play Monday, Friday, and Sunday. So if AD does, for whatever reason, miss the Monday game, he would have several days to rest and recover and potentially return for that Friday game. Uh, but that Monday game is Atlanta. And on paper, uh, the, you know, the, the, the ninth seed in the East, it should be a relatively easy matchup for the Lakers. They're, they're without Trey Young. Uh, they, they've had some recent injuries lately, but uh, the Lakers can't take any game for granted right now. Every game is a must win. And missing Anthony Davis turns their bad defense into a terrible defense, as we saw uh, at various points of this game. The Warriors were just walking to the rim. And I'm not going to get into much of the gameplay just because I think it's as simple as the Lakers were already without some of their better defensive players in Jared Vanderbilt, Gabe Vincent, and Cam Reddish. They were also without uh, one of their more impactful big men in, in Christian Wood. And then to lose Anthony Davis on top of that, uh, they were downsized. They were down defenders, and they had to lean into the offensive end, which was successful. LeBron James uh, did have 40 points. He, he had a stretch where he scored on four of five possessions uh, in the fourth quarter, and, and he was going like basically one on five uh, of just attacking the Warriors uh, in transition or, or just using a, a simple ball screen to get downhill into the rim, uh, hitting uh, tough shots, did hit that corner uh, three-pointer that ultimately was overturned. I will touch on that. Uh, in, in my second takeaway, Rui had a pretty good game. Uh, let's see. I have it here. Rui, he had 14 points. It felt like Rui had more than 14 points, but all, all of his baskets were basically uh, in, in the paint. He didn't hit a three. Uh, felt like everything was at the rim, uh, a dunk or a finish in, uh, in transition. And then D'Angelo Russell had 23 points and 13 assists. Uh, did struggle. It was 9 of 21. Uh, missed some shots in the second half that... Felt like momentum shots. Austin Reeves also struggled offensively. He had 11 points on 4-13 shooting. Uh, but really, the second Anthony Davis won out, this was going to be a loss. Like This would have really been one of the Lakers' most impressive wins of the season, uh, just given the, the stakes, given the context. Like No AD for the final three quarters. Uh, he's been one of the key differences for LA in this series just because of his sheer size and ability to dominate and impact the paint. Uh, and, and, you know, Draymond Green does do a, a solid job against him, uh, as solid as is possible in terms of just defending AD one-on-one. -on -one. But AD typically dominates the Warriors and, and dominates these matchups with, with offensive rebounding and, and finishing around the rim and, and just his ability to score uh, over guys. And, and you saw even on that play where he scored on, on Trace Jackson Davis, like AD was getting some pretty good high percentage looks and uh, eight points, four rebounds. Like that was on pace for a 32 point uh, 16 rebound game. And I don't know if he was going to necessarily get that, but the Lakers were clearly better in the AD minutes in this game. And it was a, a small sample size, but we've seen that now over the past couple of years in this Warriors matchup. So the second AD went out. Uh, I know again, LeBron had a good game. D'Lo and Rui had some good moments. Uh, Torian Prince hit a couple shots off the bench, though I, I thought his defense was pretty bad uh, against Clay Thompson. I thought Spencer Dinwiddie was a little bit more aggressive offensively. He had some pretty good defensive moments. Jackson Hayes stepped up, uh, 7 points, 12 rebounds, uh, had some nice finishes in, in uh, 28 minutes. But the second AD was out, It was that was it. And again, depending on what we continue to hear about, uh, he's going to be reevaluated tomorrow, the Lakers will have an update at 5 p.m. when they have to announce their injury report for the Monday game. Uh, but if AD has to miss any amount of time, be it even just the game, that is a, a significant loss for the Lakers that could cost them potentially a home game. Like, they should be able to beat the Hawks even without AD. But the defense, and, and without, again, like, it does not seem like Jared Vanderbilt, Gabe Vincent, or Christian Wood None of those guys have returned to practice yet in an official capacity. Like, 
I don't see them being cleared to play on Monday. So if all those guys are out, who knows about Cam Reddish? Uh, like that's just so many bodies at that point that the Lakers are down to like an eight man playable rotation. If we're saying that uh, JHS and, and Maxwell Lewis aren't ready for real minutes yet. And you're down to eight guys and really one traditional big in Jackson Hayes. And that's just tough. I don't care who you're playing. Like that's going to be a really tough game if AD misses it. So uh, 80s injury now, again, he could end up playing on Monday and, and all is well, and maybe he plays with goggles or uh, he's ultimately fine. Uh, but if AD has to miss any time and this becomes a nagging thing uh, and this is a, a more serious thing than we're anticipating, uh, that could just be uh, the, the final blow for the Lakers season. Takeaway number two is the end of this game was just absolutely ridiculous and killed any momentum that the Lakers had. Uh, so let's rewind before the 150 mark. At the 207 mark, LeBron is amid a ridiculous stretch where he's just taking over the game. He's scoring one on five, as I uh, previously said. So LeBron has Steph on him in the left corner. He takes a side dribble, fires up a insane shot from the deep part of the corner and drills that. Lakers go from down seven to down four. Then on the next possession, Steph Curry attempts a pull-up three uh, out of a pick and roll, and the ball caroms off of Andrew Wiggins and Jackson Hayes, yet the refs deem uh, initially that it's off Jackson Hayes and that it's Warriors ball. So the Lakers challenge that call. Uh, they had a challenge remaining. Uh, this is at the 150 mark. And during the replay review, it is a successful challenge, but apparently the NBA replay center in Secaucus, New Jersey, deemed that on the previous possession, LeBron had stepped out uh, in his attempt to shoot that three, and they rescinded the basket. So it went from a four-point Warriors lead to a seven-point Warriors lead. So successful challenge, but the Lakers lose three points coming out of that challenge, uh, and it was unclear whether that triggered that or not. Uh, that there was some confusion from the Lakers end after the game. Darvin Ham said he had never seen a, a call be overturned like that. LeBron James, similar thing. And there was a pool report, and they said that they they could go back and, and review and, and overturn uh, twos versus threes and, and whatnot. But it was just a weird play because you will sometimes see a call. Uh, you know, typically, it's a three-pointer be overturned to a two-pointer, but you rarely see it. Uh, and honestly, I can't remember a time when that's happened that a three-pointer has been ruled out of bounds on a previous possession when there was no challenge, there was no, uh, you know, it, it wasn't called at the time, uh, you know, an out-of-bounds situation, and then maybe it's reviewed, and, and then they they deem it that. Like, it was just last possession, that LeBron three doesn't count, it was out of bounds, and, like, it was just kind of weird. You, and it wasn't even within the final two minutes, which anything within the final two minutes can be ultimately reviewed. It wasn't, it was seven seconds before then. So just kind of a, a bizarre situation and, and a bizarre outcome there. So the refs determine that the ball was off uh, Jackson Hayes and Andrew Wiggins. Uh, so there's a jump ball at the Warriors free throw line. Jackson Hayes wins the jump ball, but he tips it basically out of bounds. And Draymond Green tries to save it and he throws it off Austin Reeves and the refs call it off Reeves, uh, Warriors ball again. Uh, but the Lakers challenged that. So two seconds have passed a second challenge because they won the first challenge. They they still had an, uh, another challenge to use. Lakers challenge that. The refs review it. And it's off Draymond. Uh, he had stepped out of bounds as he was trying to save it and, and throw it off Austin. So now it's Lakers ball with a minute 48 left. And then the madness happens because the Lakers inbound the ball and the shot clock doesn't start. And over an eight-minute stretch, uh, they try to inbound the ball four different times, and each time the shot clock doesn't start, and the the, the fans get upset. They're booing, and uh, you know, as I said, like there, there's awkward shots of the celebrities in the crowd, and like everyone's just getting antsy and, and upset. And I don't know why it took them so long to decide this, but eventually they decide that uh, Lakers PA announcer Lawrence Tanter is just going to uh, publicly announce the shot clock over the arena's speakers uh, in five-second intervals. So uh, he, he starts at 20 seconds, 15, 10, 5, etc. And I'd never seen that happen before in a game. Several, uh, you know, Darvin Ham said that, LeBron said that, like several people post-game were talking about just the, the, the fact that that like that's just never happened before uh or at least to, to people's experience and, and knowledge that has never happened before so the final 
minute 35 of this game because the Lakers, uh, in between the time when they inbounded the ball and uh, were, were dribbling up the court and, and trying to run a play, uh, some seconds uh, came off the game clock. That was also kind of weird that the Lakers just didn't get the full 148 back and, and that it was down to 135. Uh, a lot of weird parts of this ending. The, again, the final uh, minute 50 of this game took 22 real life minutes and it was just uh, all around disaster. Uh, and it really highlighted some of the issues with NBA refereeing and the replay center and, and some of the, the, the malfunctions of technology and, and just how we're kind of at the mercy of, of the shot clock and the game clock and like uh, th these things that are somewhat out of our control. And it was just kind of like all these different issues and conversations and topics like all mixed in in one uh, gumbo. And it, it was a disaster. Like it was not fun to watch. It took like it, but LeBron shot again makes it a four point game. And we're thinking that if the Warriors don't score here, the Lakers have a shot to make it a one possession game. And instead, because of the replay review, the Lakers lose three points. Now it's a two and a half possession game. And then it's just like the, the Lakers ended up turning the ball over on, on that uh, the next possession at the minute 35 mark. And then that was basically the game. I think the Warriors got an alley-oop on the next possession and like, that was it. So just didn't was not a fan of how that played out. It really highlighted, uh, again, some of the issues with, with challenging and the, and the replay review and like just the sheer amount of time it, it takes to figure some of that stuff out. Like it's one thing if, you know, that I've actually been a fan of, of the challenge call and, um, you know, w within certain contexts. And like, I, I think you should be able to use a challenge, but it shouldn't take, like, it was pretty clear. I'm not a ref, but I can see on the Jumbotron when they're showing uh, the, the replay, like, okay, that's off of uh, Jackson Hayes and Andrew Wiggins. They both touched it at the same time. It went out of bounds. It's inconclusive. Okay, it's a jump ball. And then later, like, yeah, Draymond stepped out. Okay, like, it's off the Warriors. Like, that, it shouldn't be this thing where it's a three-minute thing where they're replaying the same clip over and over again with something that's that obvious. Like, there should be some type of time limit, whether it's a minute, a minute 30, uh, but it should not be going beyond that. Uh, just because it really sucks the life out of the building. And by, by the time that play resumed, uh, the, the stakes, it, you know, just kind of felt like, uh, you know, the, the game had lost its significance. I, I just didn't like the way that that played out. I don't think anyone in the building liked how it played out. I don't think anyone watching the game, you know, clearly by the social media reaction, like it was just pretty ridiculous on, on multiple levels and something that the league is going to have to look at and, and address. And like, they got to go back and watch that. Watch all 22 minutes because that was just too long. And finally, my third takeaway is the Lakers are in a really tough spot now, standings wise. The Warriors have the inside track for the number nine seed. They have the easier remaining strength of schedule, according to Tankathon. The Warriors do have two more total games, so that is a couple more chances for them to potentially lose. And the Lakers make up some of that ground. And the teams do play again in early April. And because the Lakers have the better division record, if the Lakers win and tie the season series at 2-2, they do win the tiebreaker. If the Warriors win, they're up 3-1 in the season series, they won the tiebreaker. But by virtue of now having one fewer loss than the Lakers and having a slightly easier schedule, the Warriors are the favorites right now to win the number nine seed and potentially even go a little bit higher. And now like the, the one silver lining for the Lakers is that they do have some easier games coming up. They got the Hawks, they got the Sixers, and they got the Pacers all at home before they go on a road trip. And there are a couple back-to-backs on that road trip. Uh, and and you know, Milwaukee will be a tough game. Indiana will be a tough game. Uh, but looking at Brooklyn and Washington and Toronto and Memphis, like those are all games the Lakers should win. Those are all teams that are tanking to various degrees. So Lakers should go at least 4-2 and two on that road trip, if not 5-1. and one. If they do win all three of their upcoming games, or at least go two and one, like now we're looking at a stretch of potentially going something like seven and two. Like that's pretty realistic in the Lakers' next nine games. And that should keep them in the conversation for the nine seed. Again, if they can beat the Warriors uh, in early April when they get back. But it's a fine line right now. Like the Lakers basically have to be perfect from here on out, they have to win the games that they're supposed to win and maybe even some of the games that they're not supposed to win. And they do have one of the easier schedules. I think it's uh, the 23rd easiest remaining schedule, and the Warriors have something like the 25th or 26th. So, like, the Lakers should 
remain competitive. But I'm looking at it now. The Lakers are one loss behind the Warriors. They are three losses behind the, the Mavericks, and the Mavericks have the head-to-head tiebreakers. So that's really like four losses. Uh, they are four losses behind the Kings, who also have the head-to-head tiebreaker. So it's basically five games and four losses behind the Suns. Lakers have the tiebreaker. So that's a legit four losses. But at this point, Suns do have one of the, the toughest remaining schedules. So like that's the one team I could see potentially falling. They're in sixth right now. Uh, and you know maybe they drop to seven, eight, or, or even nine. Uh, and that has been an advantageous matchup for the Lakers at least earlier in the season. Recently, it's not been. The, the, the Suns have, have spanked them a couple of times uh, here more recently. But like the, the margin for error right now for the Lakers is just, it's gone, right? And, and they've now lost. Like they've, they've had three must-win games over the past week and a half. Uh, two against the Kings, one against the Warriors. They've gone 0-3 in those games. And like, I don't, like, yes, the, the Milwaukee game, the, the Milwaukee win without LeBron was impressive. And and yes, like beating the Timberwolves without Gobert and Towns, like still a solid win. But the games that they, like if if there was a way to like lose those two games and beat the Kings once and beat the Warriors once, like that would have been a much better outcome for the Lakers in terms of like actual standings and positioning and tiebreakers. Like, but they're basically not going to be relying on tiebreakers uh, other than the Suns and potentially the Warriors if they can win that. Uh, fourth matchup uh, in early April. So Lakers, like if they're the 10 seed, it's possible that they go on a run. But the other thing that we're looking at now is that Denver and Oklahoma City are tied for the one seed. OKC currently has the tiebreaker. They're the one seed. Denver's the two seed. But Denver has one of the easiest remaining schedules in the NBA and the Thunder have one of the hardest. So the current odds favor Denver getting the one seed. So there is a scenario now where like the Lakers, the, the realistically the highest they can probably go is like the eight seed. Uh, six seed is, is gone. Uh, there's just too many teams and too big of a gap with, with the lost column and, and the tiebreakers. Eighth is probably their best case scenario, but it's really looking like they're going to be in the 9-10 game. It's just a matter of are they nine, are they 10? And if they're in the 9-10, you now have to either win a game, could be at home, or, or win a game on the road, then go beat the seven or eight seed, whoever lost that game on the road, and then you get in, if you win that, assuming you win that, you get in as the eighth seed, and now you are rewarded with the team that you have not beaten uh, in eight straight games, and the probably the, the championship favorites, or at least the favorites to get out of the West, in the Denver Nuggets. And you might have a situation where you're playing uh, the two play-in games, and then going to Denver for game one, all within a span of like four or five days. So you, and you close the the, the uh, season out with a couple of games on the road. So like Lakers could have like a five game road trip in a span of like eight or nine days, something like that. It, going into Denver again, you you've just played in potentially four other cities. Now you're going into Denver, one of the toughest places to play in the league, one of the toughest places for you to play specifically, and you're trying to figure out like game one, which has been the Lakers' recipe. Obviously, going back to last season, like you got to steal game one. You steal it against Memphis. You steal it against Golden State. You win both of those series. But coming into Denver with, with that uh, much of a, a rest disadvantage and, and just a travel disadvantage uh, and, and not being able to to game plan. Like Denver, uh, I guess, could be game planning for multiple opponents. But for the Lakers, like you can game plan for Denver, but uh, you got to really be focusing on the, the matchup ahead. So that's just a tough situation for them if that's how it plays out. And that's the way it's looking like it's going to play out, that they're probably going to be in the 9-10. And again, they have to win now two games just to get the eight seed. And then when you factor in, they already played an extra game because of the in-season tournament championship. They're going to be playing 85 games potentially, three extra uh, regular season games, or you know, technically not regular season games, but three extra games in between the start of the regular season and the start of the playoffs just to get the eight seed to then potentially play the Denver Nuggets, a team that has had their number for two years now. So... Uh, a tough road ahead for the Lakers. Again, like things are looking pretty bleak right now. Uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It, it could turn around uh, again. If, if they rip off a streak of like five wins in a row, six wins in a row, or, or five out of six, six out of seven, like something like that, that can turn things around, especially if the Warriors drop an, a game or two here coming up o- over the next week or so uh, or, or a couple weeks. But like the Lakers have to basically play perfect basketball to end the season it's something we've yet to really see from them. They have had some good stretches recently, but not to that level. And if they can't do that, 
And again, we don't know what's happening with Anthony Davis. LeBron is still dealing with an ankle injury. We still have Jared Vanderbilt coming back, potentially Gabe Vincent, Christian Wood. Like, how are those guys acclimated uh, and, and sort of, uh, you know, in, injected it back into the, the rotation and lineups and all that stuff? Like, there's a lot of unknown variables here, a lot that can go wrong, a lot that has been going wrong. And we'll see. Like, uh, it's just, it, it's a very uh, delicate balance for the Lakers moving forward in terms of getting all these things right, you know, keep staying healthy, getting some some good fortune, and, and then winning not only the games they're supposed to win, but some of the games that they're probably not. So on that note, I will end the show. It was a disastrous night for the Lakers, losing this game, losing AD, and the potential longer-term ramifications of just how the rest of the season has to play out. But if you enjoyed my analysis and assessment, I hope you did. Uh, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. If you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, I hope you consider following the show, downloading it, and leaving a five-star review. And I will be back on Monday with episode five of Buha's Block. I'll talk to you soon.